Aloha. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for joining us for Pacific Forum's third Comparative Connections Roundtable on the subject of South Korea's upcoming presidential election. My name is Rob York, Director for Regional Affairs at the Pacific Forum, Editor at Comparative Connections, a triannual e-journal of bilateral relations in the Indo-Pacific, and your MC for today's event. For those of you who are not familiar with the publication, Comparative Connections is published three times per year, providing timely analysis on key bilateral relationships across the Indo-Pacific. A link to the key findings from our previous roundtable on the topic of Japan's elections and its foreign relations can be found in the chat box now. Every issue of Comparative Connections is made up of 12 regular chapters, plus one rotating chapter appearing once yearly, each authored by recognized specialists who review critical developments within a given relationship and assess their implications for regional security, U.S. interests, and the future of the region at large. Each chapter also includes a carefully curated chronology section that synthesizes the day-to-day -day policy developments, diplomatic engagements, and bilateral exchanges that outline the trajectory of each relationship. These chapter chronologies contribute to a running sortable chronology section of the website that dates back to the first issue of Comparative Connections in 1999. In addition to these analytical chapters and bilateral chronologies, the Comparative Connections website hosts two databases, a state's visits database dedicated to tracking official visits by heads of state and our multilateral forums database, which similarly tracks the occurrence of select high level meetings. These various components of the site complement one another to provide users with a holistic understanding of each bilateral relationship's rich history, contemporary successes and challenges, and future areas for cooperation. A link to view our most recent issue of Comparative Connections can be found in the chat box now. Today to discuss the presidential election in South Korea and its impact on relationships with the US, China, and Japan, we are joined by the co-author of our US-Korea chapter, first of all, Dr. Mason Ritchie. Dr. Ritchie is an Associate Professor of International Politics at Hankook University of Foreign Studies in Seoul and Senior Contributor at the Asia Society. Dr. Ritchie has also held positions as a POSCO Visiting Research Fellow at the East-West Center in Honolulu and a DAAD Scholar at the University of Potsdam. His research focuses on U.S. and European foreign and security policy as applied to the Asia-Pacific. See the chat now for his most recent chapter. He will be followed by the co-author of our China-Korea chapter, Mr. Scott Snyder. Mr. Snyder is a Senior Fellow for Korea Studies and Director of the Program on U.S.-Korea Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. This program examines South Korea's efforts to contribute to the international stage, its potential influence and contributions as a middle power, and the implications of North Korean instability. He is also a contributor for the blog Asia Unbound and previously served as project director for CFR's independent task force on policy toward the Korean Peninsula. See the chat now for his most recent chapter. Also, our last but by no means least speaker for today will be the co-author of our Japan-Korea chapter, Dr. Jiung Lee. Dr. Lee is a political scientist who teaches at American University's School of International Service. She is the author of China's Hegemony, 400 Years of East Asian Domination. She has published articles in Security Studies, International Relations of the Asia Pacific, and Journal of East Asian Studies. Previously, she was a Millen Postdoctoral Fellow in Politics and East Asian Studies, a POSCO Visiting Fellow at the East-West Center, and a non-resident James A. Kelly Korean Studies Fellow at Pacific Forum. For her most recent chapter, check the chat box now. I want to thank each of our distinguished speakers for being here today. We look forward to your remarks and to the fruitful discussion that will certainly follow. After our panelist presentation, we will transition to a Q&A segment where we will welcome feedback and questions from the audience. I would now like to give the floor to our moderator, Ralph Kosa, President Emeritus of Pacific Forum and the current WSD Handa Chair at Pacific Forum, as well as the co-author of Comparative Connections Regional Overview. Ralph. Thank you, Rob, and aloha, everyone. Welcome to this session. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, uh, as I know you are. So let's get right into it. And we'll ask uh, Mason to start us off, please. 
Great, thank you very much um, to uh, to Rob and to Ralph um, and to everyone at Pacific Forum, uh, including the wonderful staff um, who've done such great work uh, getting this set up. Uh, I'm grateful uh, for the uh, opportunity uh, to speak today. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about uh, the South Korea presidential uh, election. Uh, so I'm going to break my comments up into sort of uh, four areas. Um, the first of which is going to sort of cover uh, what I think is, at least on the surface, the most noticeable uh, uh, set of uh, things that have gone on in this uh, election uh, campaign. Uh, the second thing uh is a sort of um, analysis is probably too strong a word, but a sort of evaluation perhaps uh, about what this might mean a, a little bit uh, for uh, what we can uh, perceive in terms of the way that the candidates are coming across to the general population uh, in Korea. Uh, from that, I'll, I'll sort of draw a conclusion, I guess, a little bit uh, more broadly, perhaps about the state of uh, Korean democracy and sort of the direction that it's moving in. Uh, <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll close by talking about uh, actually some of the substantive uh, issues uh, in the election. The fact that I'm coming to that last, um, I think already presages in some sense what I'm going to say to start with, um, which is that there hasn't been, frankly speaking, a lot of substance uh, and a lot of uh, in-depth policy uh, discussion in this election. And of course, I guess to some degree, we all might think that that's uh, natural anyway. We, I guess we have all sort of moved into a world where politics has become increasingly more superficial. Um, but I would make an argument that at least in Korea this time, this has been especially noticeable. So my first set of remarks go to the fact that this uh, particular election has been um, marked by scandal uh, and by salaciousness and by mudslinging uh, in a way that I think is unique, uh, you know, at least in the time, the, the decade plus that I've been in, in, in South Korea. Uh, to some degree, the whole campaign has been overshadowed by a real estate scandal uh, in a satellite city uh, of Seoul called Songnam. This is a very sensitive issue. Uh, for people in Korea because uh, housing costs uh, have been rising so dramatically. Getting on the housing ladder um, has uh, become increasingly uh, difficult and out of reach, especially for uh, younger people who are extremely resentful uh, of this. And what's interesting about this real estate scandal is that it hasn't exactly cut one way or the other in terms of helping one party or the other as both of them, and in fact, both candidates have been implicated in the scandal in one way. Arguably, uh, Lee Jae-myung, the candidate of the ruling Democratic Party, has been hurt by this uh, a little bit more insofar as he was actually the former mayor of the city of Songnam. Uh, and in that sense, uh, you know, he and his people were a little bit closer to the lever of, of power uh, when some of these real estate shenanigans were going on. Uh, but uh, the candidate for the People's Power Party, Yoon suk yeol the conservative uh, opposition party, uh, is also, or and people around him are also implicated in this. So neither candidate has really been able to make hay from this uh, real estate scandal. And this has really been, I think, sort of setting the tone for how people look at both of these candidates um, as ultimately uh, self-serving and off-putting, uh, generally speaking. Looking at the two candidates in their campaigns, uh, I call the Yoon campaign the campaign Hindenburg. Um, you know, there's no charisma. Uh, he's not a politician. Uh, he's a former prosecutor. Uh, he doesn't have deep roots in the party. Uh, and he's just not a politician. You can see that from the way he carries himself, from the way that he speaks. Uh, and the fact that he doesn't have deep roots in the, the People's Power Party, the conservative party, means his campaign has... Um, been marked by infighting. Uh, the campaign leadership has dissolved at least twice. Uh, and there have been periods where we've gone weeks without hearing anything substantive about policy simply because the campaign couldn't figure out what in the world their policy was. Uh, and everyone in the campaign was, was self-serving and trying to simply occupy a position in order to perhaps get some position of power if Yoon were to win. Uh, in addition to that, there's some, what, uh, some elements of what I call the bizarre um, there was a strange incident with Yoon outside of a metro station, uh, you know, trying to greet people and everyone ignoring him. It was really an odd look. Um, he's made comments that structural uh, gender discrimination in South Korea is over, which I assure you is not the case. 
Uh, there are reports of him getting shamanistic advice from uh, an anal acu acupuncturist. You probably didn't have that on your bingo card for today, but that's actually happened. It's plagued him multiple times. His wife has also been a huge problem. Uh, she's been implicated as being possibly a hostess bar uh, worker in the past. She's fabricated parts of her resume. Uh, she said that the, the problem with Me Too complaints uh, for the political parties is that they're not simply paying the accusers to make the, the, the problems go away and the, the complaints go away. Uh, she's threatened to throw journalists in jail um, if her husband is elected. Um, she's been a huge uh, millstone around his neck. The, the E.J. Young campaign, I call the campaign clown car. Uh, and the fact that with all of what I just said about Yoon being the case, he, you know, Lee isn't able to, to, to be doing better, especially considering how successfully the, the Democratic Party has handled COVID, really tells you how much he's disliked. Uh, as I said, the Songnam real estate scandal uh, is, is hanging over his head. Uh, his campaign has also had huge infighting. Some of you might have noticed he has not published a foreign affairs piece like Yoon Suk Yeol has about his team's foreign policy. That's because they have different camps who are divided about what his foreign policy is. Uh, his wife has also been a problem. She used civil servants and you know, government credit cards in order to pay for personal tasks and expenses. There are damaging recordings about Lee with his uh, saying horrible things about members of his family. He's accused himself or has been accused himself of sexual harassment. Uh, there's a minor candidate, uh, An Chol Su, uh, whose vanity uh, candidacy for president um, uh, hurts Yoon because in theory, some of uh, An Chol Su's supporters would be more likely to vote for, uh, to vote for Yoon uh, than for, for Lee Jae-myung. Uh, and he's so far uh, not managed to merge uh, his campaign with that of Yoon. Uh, and you know, to some degree, there's sort of unfortunate and tragic symbolism of the fact that literally two people died in his campaign bus, one of which was a bus driver, the other one was a, a campaign staffer who died of carbon monoxide poisoning because the campaign illegally uh, 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 altered the bus to have a big campaign screen there and the generators caused carbon monoxide to come into the bus that killed some of his campaign workers. Um, so the bottom line, so moving into my second point, is that this campaign has been marked by mudslinging, populism, anti-pluralism, anti-liberalism. Uh, the candidates are widely loathed. They inspire very little interest. Uh, they are frankly misogynistic. They are xenophobic. They are discriminatory. Uh, they're, uh, they're courting of uh, young uh, anti-feminist uh, thuggish males has been very off-putting uh, to a lot of people. They are anti-foreigner. Uh, you know, both both campaigns have talked about foreigners using the National Healthcare Service here in a way that that was clearly uh, just you know trolling for populist votes against uh, uh, against foreigners. Uh, neither campaign seems to be willing to put forth a lot of effort to pass an anti-discrimination law, which has been in the National Assembly in various forms for years and years. Uh, so then uh, you know, my third point, sort of drawing from that, beyond the metrics uh, about South Korea's democracy, which, you know, formally speaking, um, clearly show that, that South Korea is a, is a strong democracy, uh, I think that we can see some cracks in the liberal democracy here. And, and I'm not the only one who's noticed that. Many of you have probably been familiar with the work of Ji Yuk Shin, um, who's made that point um, in multiple fora uh, as well. You know, I think that the, the, the populism, the anti-pluralism, the anti-liberalism that we're seeing here um, marks a shift uh, away from South Korean democratic consolidation um, over the last uh, you know, 35 years. It's in its early stages. It's still fixable, um, but there's very little in the structure of the parties and certainly the, uh, the programs and the platforms of the candidates and their demeanor that indicate that this is, is going to get better. Um, as I said, it is still fixable. And I think the one plank of the sort of um, democratic backsliding that we've seen in a lot of the other parts of the world um, namely, um, anti-expertise, I guess you would say, is still not really the case here. Um, notably with COVID, of course, we've seen the population largely um, support uh, the technocratic vision of you know, how to control the spread of the pandemic here. Uh, and the candidates haven't called that into question, I think largely because people still here respect expertise uh, in a way that perhaps we've lost in the United States and in places in Europe.
Um, nonetheless, I think the overall sort of beginning phases of some of the democratic backsliding that we're seeing in Korea is, is kind of disappointing when we think back to five years ago, uh, where the impeachment of Park Geun-hye, uh, the candlelight vigils, uh, for a lot of people marked a sort of moment of maturation um, of South Korean democracy. And I think the, the fact that we're here five years later, you know, scratching our heads as to what's happened is, I think, kind of disappointing for a lot of people. Um, lastly, to go into actually some of the policy and politics, sorry, it's taking me 10 minutes to get here. But um, as I said, it hasn't been the most important part of the, of the campaign, frankly. Um, the debates have been a farce. They've been mostly about mudslinging. Um, but as far as we can tell, domestically, honestly, there are many areas where there's not a huge difference um, between the two candidates. Uh, Lee started out as a leftist, um, but he's backtracked on a number of his more leftist policies, such as the land tax and of the universal basic income. Uh, Yoon and Lee, um, you know, both want more housing starts. They both want more public-private investment. Neither has much uh, love for the anti-discrimination law. Neither have answers to gender discrimination and demographic challenges. Uh, neither have answers to chable dominance, so the large corporate dominance of the economy here, uh, and, and really even supply chain resilience more generally. Uh, both want similar policies on COVID, um, as I said, uh, going forward. There's some debate about the size of the bailout packages for businesses, but it's really a question of degree rather than a question of kind. One of the areas where there's a significant disagreement is on the nuclear phase-out policy. The Moon Jae-in administration is trying to move away from, from nuclear power. Uh, Yoon wants to move back into it, and Lee will probably keep driving the nuclear phase-out policy forward. On well, foreign policy, superficially at least, there are bigger differences, um, but South Korea faces significant constraints on foreign policy entrepreneurship. Um, both North Korea um, and China mean South Korea has limited options um, to, to freelance. So I think the U.S. Rock Alliance will be safe uh, in, in both cases. Uh, I'll finish up here in my last minute. Um, you know, the additional THAAD battery issue could become uh, a question. Um, I think it's more likely uh, to be installed if necessary under Yoon than with Lee, who probably would push back. Um, Yoon is on record as wanting tactical nuclear uh, missiles here, but he's already been rebuffed by that. So I don't think it's going to happen, even if he asked. Uh, Lee causes more concern on you know, South Korea-China relations, at least from a Washington perspective. But public opinion is very much anti-China here. So I think he'll be limited in the amount of damage he could do there. Uh, on North Korea, Lee seems more likely to push forward on an end of war declaration and sort of continue some of the moon policies. But even then, he's not known as being quite as ideological in North Korea as Moon Jae-in is. Uh, he probably will push forward more on the wartime operational control uh, transfer than Yoon will. Uh, Yoon probably is, is better on, uh, than Lee on Japan. Um, although, again, I don't think that there's a big rapprochement to come between Seoul and Tokyo, even if Yoon uh, wins. Uh, overall, the U.S., I think the, at least the pundit class is more comfortable with Yoon than with Lee, all things being equal. Um, but I, you know, I don't really see either candidate um, uh, you know, breaking the alliance or even coming close. So to conclude, uh, I think Yoon probably wins a close race. Uh, it might be a little bit um, larger uh, difference if uh, An Chol Su and Yoon managed to merge the, cam the campaigns, but so far that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, and I think one last uh, interesting point, at least domestically, is uh, if Yoon wins, he's going to have to place a prime minister, uh, despite the fact that he's going to have a supermajority in the National Assembly, which is still dominated by the Democratic Party. Um, and so his legislative agenda, as well as his prime ministerial um, appointment, which needs the consent of the National Assembly, will probably be um, subject to some pretty significant uh, negotiation hurdles. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop, and I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone has um, uh, in the Q&A session. So thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Good, Mason. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go right to Scott, please. Okay, well, thank you uh, for having me today. Uh, really uh, enjoyed uh, Mason's presentation, uh, although it was quite depressing. Uh, I might, uh, and I agree with him about some of the constraints, um, and I'm really going to focus on China-Korea relations, but I just want to add that at least from a platform perspective, uh, it seems to me that the postures of the two leading candidates are uh, different in terms of their inclinations uh, in the following way. 
I think that Lee is very much focused on government solutions to a lot of Korea's problems. Uh, in many respects, I think that the ruling party candidate uh, is more aligned with Bernie Sanders in a lot of his policy platform ideas. Uh, whereas Yoon is uh, really more of a classic Korean conservative and a lot of his policies end up being more market-based. But you know, where you end up coming out uh, when you're in power facing constraints, that may be a different matter. So I'm really focusing on the China-Korea relationship uh, and it's um, uh, the impact of the election on China-Korea relations. Uh, and I already have a title for my next comparative connections um, brief that I'm going to write. Um, uh, it is the Olympic flame and the China South Korea tinderbox, uh, because there has been a lot going on, uh, especially as related to the China South Korea relationship, uh, in part because of the election and because the Beijing Olympics has happened right uh, before the election. Uh, and so I would say that the main impact of the election has actually been to magnify and to politicize uh, South Korean negative sentiments towards China. Uh, and I'll go into detail about uh, the types of South Korean negative uh, sentiments towards China that we've seen uh, as South Koreans have watched, uh, you know, the, 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 watching the Olympics from the South Korean point of view. Uh, Mason has already mentioned uh, the THAAD issue has come up. Uh, and the candidates have slightly different perceptions on those issues. Uh, and because of the Olympics, um, the Chinese embassy in South Korea has been extraordinarily active uh, during the course of the Olympics period, issuing three separate statements, uh, which is kind of remarkable for an embassy to be that involved in issuing statements in the context of an election campaign. And so just to step back, uh, there are some very interesting recent data points, uh, you know, overall the picture in terms of South Korean public opinion towards China uh, over the course of the past year has been one of deterioration. Uh, and the latest evidences of that deterioration show up uh, in a January Chicago Council on Global Affairs survey uh, in which uh, South Koreans rate China at 3.1 on a one to 10 scale, uh, with three being pretty negative and right alongside Japan and North Korea. Uh, the US uh, for reference is a six on that scale. Uh, and for the Chicago Council poll, uh, the last time they asked the question was in 2019, at which time China was 4.8. So we see that over the course of the past three years, there's been a pretty dramatic deterioration uh, in South Korean uh, views of China. Uh, a substantial portion of that is economic, but the big, biggest uh, uh, threat uh, perception is really in the security realm with 83% of South Koreans um, seeing China as a security threat. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, there is some January um, Chungang Ilbo uh, data. Uh, some of it is polling data, but uh, Chungang also did a kind of social media scraping project, uh, which shows that even pre-Olympics, uh, and maybe these are the issues that provide context for the um, uh, negative sentiments toward China. We've got issues like... Uh, China having trying to register, register Bao Tsai uh, with the UN as uh, Chinese. Uh, Bao Tsai is the Chinese version of kimchi. So you know you're hitting on a, a nerve. Um, there are some uh, video games, uh, Chinese made video games uh, that have appropriated South Korean uh, images and Hanbok uh, namely. Uh, and uh, there was also a case where a Chinese actor uh, uh, stated that all martial arts, including Taekwondo, originate in China. So all these issues uh, were just fertile ground for South Korean viewers when they saw the opening ceremony of the Olympics uh, to uh, identify the ethnic Korean 
uh, woman in um, uh, the uh, procession um, uh, as wearing hanbok and as a further evidence of Chinese cultural appropriation. And so even before the flame was lit, <laughs> the South Koreans already had an issue uh, of difference uh, with China in terms of uh, uh, the representation uh, in the opening ceremony. Um, another issue that it was focused on uh, in the run-up to the Olympics was related to representation. Uh, the Moon administration has been criticized for being pro-China. Uh, they did... Um, uh, they did not follow the U.S. example on a diplomatic boycott, uh, deciding to send the Minister of Sports and Culture as their official representative. Uh, but then uh, the National Assembly Speaker also went on an informal visit at the same time, and the National S Assembly Speaker is second in the protocol uh, rank. Uh, and so that uh, generated uh, some controversy. And then, of course, um, we had uh, a huge controversy over short track skating disqualifications of two Korean skaters that paved the way for Chinese skaters to win uh, the gold and silver uh, in one of the events. And as anyone who has followed U.S.-South Korea relations for a long time knows and remembers the Salt Lake City 2002 Olympic Games, uh, the one thing that you don't want to do as related to South Korea is mess with their short track skaters. Uh, and so uh, China has had its own controversy uh, um, related to that issue uh, and some really harsh statements, um, not only in the media, but also, of course, from all of the major presidential candidates with regard to uh, the uh, Chinese, uh, the perception that the, that the judging was influenced uh, by China. Um, and so, you know, all of those issues really just poured fuel on the fire uh, as related to China as an issue in the election campaign. I think that the major impact of that uh, has actually been to uh, reduce the salience of um, any China gaps uh, among the candidates uh, that might have existed, they've all been erased because basically there's no space for any Korean presidential candidate to express a sentiment that might be pro-China. Um, in terms of their overall orientations, you know, as Mason said, uh, opposition party candidate Yoon um, has been more explicit in aligning himself with the U.S., whereas Lee has maintained that he's going to be more autonomous in his, his choices. Um, the other issue that I really want to grapple with as a background issue in the context of the election is um, related to um, uh, North and South Korea and the rise of uh, Sino-U.S. major power rivalry. Uh, and on that issue, I think that what has been very interesting has been that now for almost a decade, uh, the dominant framing uh, in almost all South Korean strategic conversations about the U.S. and China and rising rivalry has been one in which uh, China has been reserved as the uh, area where South Korea benefits in terms of economic opportunity while the U.S. has been the strategic partner that guarantees South Korean security, and there really has been no major difficulty for South Korea in terms of being able to kind of, you know, have it that way. Uh, but I think that under the Biden administration, and maybe prior to that, but I think that, you know, really most explicitly under the Biden administration uh, and the Biden Moon Joint Statement from last May, uh, really directly challenges that framework in some new ways. Uh, and I think the main way that it does it is related to the issue of supply chain resilience, uh, which really calls upon South Korea to cooperate with the U.S. and to suspend some forms of economic cooperation with China uh, through the securitization of technology. 
Uh, and of course, the joint statement back in May also identified a whole range of areas of cooperation for the US-South Korea alliance. Uh, they were mostly, they were mainly functional uh, and they did not explicitly name China, unlike uh, similar US-Japan documents. Uh, but we shouldn't kid ourselves about what uh, all of those identified areas of cooperation you know, are all about. Uh, and likewise, it's been very interesting to look at the areas of cooperation laid out uh, for uh, US and South Korea. You know, the main deliverables uh, that I noticed were the supply chain resiliency, climate change, and the vaccine partnership which basically constituted the initial agenda uh, for the Quad. Uh, and so there's a really interesting situation related to South Korean foreign policy uh, uh, and the Sino-US rivalry where South Korea is, um, as it claims to be a middle power, middle power should really be focused on multilateral engagement and cooperation and bridge building um, and brokering uh, but all of its cooperation uh, re related to Asia Pacific issues are being framed in the context of the bilateral alliance relationship, not in terms of joining horizontal multilateral relationships. And so that's just something really interesting and I think going to be uh, very uh, interesting to watch. Um, one other issue that I think has come up that I want to touch on is the FAD issue. Uh, and the reason why FAD is so interesting to me right now is because the conservative candidate Yoon uh, has framed uh, FAD acquisition as something that South Korea should get for itself, uh, rather than uh, something that it is doing as a favor for the US in terms of the deployment as was the case back in 2016 and 2017. And so I think that is gonna be very interesting to watch and could be very complicated uh, for a UN administration in terms of managing the relationship with China. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how China responds to that. And then I just wanna say a couple of words about North Korea and the US-China rivalry. I've obviously left very little time for that, uh, but you know that is in part because um, the North Korean position has become a lot less interesting because of its increased alignment with China. Uh, and we all know that most of North Korea's diplomacy simply hasn't been happening because of the pandemic. But in the case of the North Korea-China relationship, we've seen a lot of public messaging and a lot of letter writing uh, between the leaders at the leader level. Uh, and it is really all about doubling down on the strategic relationship uh, between China and North Korea. Um, I like to say that uh, North Korea's strategic space is defined by the level of US-China mistrust. Uh, and in the context that has been set, North Korea has a lot of strategic space to work with. Uh, in fact, so much so that uh, the UN mechanisms are paralyzed in terms of responding to North Korean provocations I think the really interesting outstanding question, and this is really my last point, is um, what uh, is the limit of uh, China's ability to tolerate uh, some of North Korea's um, um, uh, escalation of provocation as we go forward? Because we all know what North Korea has said that it wants to do in the Workers' Party Congress. Uh, and there are a number of things, including longer range missiles, possible satellite launches uh, that will run up against the boundary of what the international community will find acceptable. So let me stop there. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Ji Young, please. Thank you. I have prepared a uh, brief PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let me see. Okay, um, thank you Pacific Forum for creating this opportunity. Um, I am learning a lot from my fellow panelists and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, next slide, please. Today, I will talk 
briefly about Seoul Tokyo relations and um, briefly um, address three uh, questions. One, uh, where do they stand now? Two, how do South Korean presidential candidates view South Korea's relations with Japan? And three, what are some key factors that will likely affect the future of bilateral relations? Next slide, please. So many have characterized um, Japan-South Korea relations in recent years as being at their worst since the 1965 normalization. Next, please. Um, since President Moon Jae-in came into office in 2017, uh, three issues have become particularly responsible for the worsening of relations. One was the fate and failure of the 2015 Comfort Women Agreement. Two was in 2018, South Korean Supreme Court ruling that to, the Japanese companies must compensate South Koreans forced into labor during Japan's occupation of the Korean Peninsula from 1910 to 1945. And three, Japan's decision in July 2019 to impose export restrictions on the chemicals that are being used for semiconductors um, that South Korean companies use. Next slide, oh, next please. So when you look at Japan-Korea relations, you, you know, we're familiar with contentious you know, um, dynamics when it comes to history issues. But in the last five years or so, what is new um, and their historic low relationship is evidenced by um, three developments at least. One is previously, even when relations were rough, um, their joint efforts for deterring North Korea's propagation used to bring them together, um, especially together with the United States. Uh, but this dynamic has become much weaker. Two, next. Um, what sustained the bilateral relations was uh, what we call hot economics, um, even when politics was cold. But with the export restriction and other measures, um, you know, right now, the economic interdependence um, actually began to be used as a tool of politics, uh, which actually does not bode very well when we think about the future of the relations. Next three, prior to, um, you know, Moon Jae-in's predecessor, Park Geun-hye, um, Seoul and Tokyo, um, you know, when they have um, a new leader inaugurated either in Japan um, or in South Korea, um, this uh, used to create an opportunity and new political momentum for the leaders of the two countries to come together. Uh, but in the last few years, we begin to see how um, changes in the leadership does not necessarily lead to a new momentum for diplomacy. And we have seen this pattern with the inauguration of Prime Minister Suga and Kishida in Japan. Next slide, please. So then um, what can we expect from South Korea's new president, presidential, uh, president in terms of Japan-South Korea relations? Um, Lee Jae-myung of the incumbent Democratic Party, Yoon suk Neil of the main opposition People's Power Party, and An chol Su of the minor opposition People's Party have all proposed that South Korea must mend ties with Japan. In particular for Lee Jae-myung, Despite his reputation um, for being a Japan hawk, uh, he, he said that he is committed to repairing the uh, tenuous relationship between Korea and Japan. And Yoon Song Nyo similarly said that if I become president, I will set out to improve South Korea Japan relations as soon as I take office. But comparably speaking, uh, Lee Jae Myung holds a uh, tougher stance on territorial and historical issues, emphasizing Japan's need for offering sincere apologies for better relations. On this thorny issue of forced labor, um, he maintains that Japan should carry out the South Korean Supreme Court decision, meaning that Japanese companies should compensate Korean victims. Yoon song yeol does view that apologies are important for the comfort woman issue, but the nuance is slightly different. He believes that there should be a comprehensive solution in 
soul to kill relations, and that the forced labor issue should be part of that big picture. When asked which country he would um, hold a summit meeting first if he were to become a president, he did say that he will meet the US President Biden first and then Japanese Prime Minister Kishida, uh, followed by um, Chinese and North Korean leaders. Next, please. So together, um, how Japan under a new president will manage relations with Japan should be understood in the larger context of how much convergence there is between Japanese and South Korean foreign policy pre preferences. Um, if you can click a few times, the table is going to show. Thank you. Um, so this is a rough sketch of their positions, but on North Korea policy, Lee Jae-myung uh, comes from this broad idea that dialogue and other positive incentives can lead North Korea to denuclearize, whereas conservative candidate Yoon suk yeol rests uh, his policy on the idea that North Korea should take first steps towards denuclearization before positive rewards are given to them. Broadly, their respective views on North Korea represent the progressive and conservative camps arguments. Um, and when it comes to Japan's North Korea policy, um, they rest more on pressure and sanctions, even while Japanese leaders have said that they are open to hold a summit meeting with Kim Jong-un with the goal of resolving the abduction issue in mind. On the question of alliance with the United States, again, the two candidates pretty much follow their respective progressive and conservative camps argument, with uh, Yoon pledging to restore and strengthen the alliance with the United States. Lee Jae-myung's policy on the United States sounds more or less similar to what Moon has been doing. Uh, while the alliance is at the center of South Korean defense and security, um, the view is that it is possible that uh, he will approach uh, relations with the United States with the goal of improving North Korea's um, engagement with the world and inter-Korean relations. Um, and of course, for Japan, strong relations with the United States um, has been uh, central to its foreign policy. When it comes to China policy, in my view, um, I, I tend to agree with what Scott has just shared. Um, there still is a lot of fuzziness as to how each candidate will seek to navigate its China policy. Uh, but broadly speaking, it seems that Lee Jae-myung will probably follow Moon's policy of trying not to actively take up any issues that can appear to take sides between Washington and Beijing. For Yoon, uh, he takes note of uh, anti-Chinese sentiments that have become salient, especially during the Olympics, and has criticized uh, Moon Jae-in's three no's towards China, basically where the Moon administration stated that South Korea would not seek trilateral alliance with Japan and the United States, will not seek additional thoughts, and will not seek um, will not join a U.S. ballistic missile system. Um, you know, implicate, when we think about implications of these differences between these two candidates on its relations with Japan, um, they're not immediately clear. Um, um, for Japan, it has been hedging its bet by strengthening its defense efforts um, while seeking to cooperate with China where possible. But it is perhaps worth mentioning that South Korea and Japan currently do not plan on joining the hands to counter growing Chinese influence in the region. So whoever becomes a president in South Korea, uh, this will not be an easy question to explore. When it comes to regional strategy, it seems that while Lee Jae-myung will likely to continue the Moon administration's policy, um, Yoon might pay greater attention to stronger trilateral cooperation with Japan and the United States. And uh, he has been talking about a rules-based international order. This sounds a bit like what Japan has been talking about, which is free and open in the Pacific. Um, but the substantive content of exactly what they mean uh, remains to be seen. Next slide, please. So to uh, wrap up uh, my presentation, um, 
whoever becomes South Korea's next president, uh, working with Japan on forced labor issue will be the key to whether there are positive changes in bilateral relations. And um, Japan has been maintaining the stance that it has to be South Korea uh, that should take the first step towards concrete measures to address the situation. Um, and if there is any window of opportunity, um, broadly speaking, just generally uh, for any political momentum in these bilateral relations, it will be uh, probably immediately after the election like many other uh, experts have noted. And other consideration include um, with some long-term implications and um, um, consideration is apology fatigue in Japan about Korea. Um, it's not likely that Japan will apologize first to improve relations. Um, and if this becomes the first requirement for the improvement of relations, it probably is difficult to uh, expect any um, immediate breakthrough um, anytime soon. And lastly, but not least, public opinions matter. Um, it is a good reminder that they're not so great, but um, a lot actually we, we noted in the past uh, depends on politics and what political leaders do. Right now, 63% um, of South Koreans and 49% of Japanese have um, um, answered that they, they have a poor impression of the other country. Um, this was um, uh, conducted um, in September 2021. So with that, I will uh, end my presentation here and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And thank you to all three presenters. I think very good presentations, very comprehensive. And I, I didn't notice a lot of disagreement uh, among the three. Uh, I will, uh, during the Q&A session, uh, give each of you a chance to uh, ask any question you want of the other two presenters uh, in case there were things where, uh, where you did have a disagreement. Uh, at this point, we're going to turn it uh, to the audience. Uh, you have two ways of intervening. One, uh, hit the raise hand function, and then I will call on you and you can ask a question. Uh, and second, you can click on the Q&A session, as one of our participants already has, uh, and then I will read out uh, that particular question uh, for you. And I'm going to take a series of questions and then go back to the three presenters. Uh, and I have a couple of questions myself that I'm going to throw in during the first round. Uh, but let me go to uh, Wilson's uh, question, which is uh, regarding the upcoming election, aside from An Chol Su, uh, are there any other minority party candidates that can have a potential role in the overall outcome? And he's particularly curious as to why left-leaning minority candidates don't seem to put pressure on Lee uh, to concede in some of these areas. So uh, I, I will add to that my own uh, couple of questions uh, to all three of you, if I can. Uh, traditionally, North Korea has tried to do something to influence the election. Uh, and traditionally, it normally backfires, but they do try to do something. But I haven't heard any, any real insights or any real comments on what North Koreans may or may not be doing uh, to try to impact this election. So. Uh, are they up to anything and uh, what's the likely uh, impact of it? Secondly, I understand that uh, President Moon has pardoned uh, President Park. Uh, what does this mean and will that have any sort of an impact? Uh, I had received a question from a, a reporter on this asking me whether this was a quote, healing moment or not. Uh, I have great doubts that this will heal anything, but I, I would like to hear your three comments on that. Uh, and then lastly, just because it's the fixated uh, issue on everyone's mind in the United States, uh, has anyone there talked about Ukraine? Are, are there any differences or any views on Ukraine? Or is uh, Korea sort of focused on Korea and, and not the rest of the world? Uh, let me start with Mason, and then we'll go down to, to Scott and Ji Young. Mason, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, so I'll try to hit some or, or most of these. <clears throat> um, to start with the first question, um, any other minor candidates? Um, the short answer is um, no, not really. As I said, you know, Anchol Su, I think he's polling now at about six and a half percent. 
uh, the conventional wisdom is, um, you know, if he were to, to abandon his campaign, you know, in some sort of negotiated merge with Yoon, that his supporters would break more for Yoon than for, for E, which would help uh, Yoon uh, widen what is uh, already a, a, a small lead, at least, you know, to, to the extent that we can trust the polls here. The polls here, I, I should also note, by the way, are they, they have in some instances varied quite widely. <laughs> um, you can on the same day read three different polls, one of which has Yoon up by eight or nine points and well outside the margin of error. And then you'll show another one uh, that's inside the margin of error. So polling here doesn't seem to be perfect. This has something to do with the methodology about who they call and whether or not they're using uh, landlines and, and cell, cell phones and how that skews the, the demographics of who, of who they're polling. Um, I, I think it's relatively close. I, I'm, I'm, it's, probably, it's probably close to the margin of error. And so that might make a difference for Yoon if, if the two candidates were, if, if uh, Anshul Su and, and Yoon were to merge their candidacies. Um, the, the gender issue is an interesting one. Um, and I, I could talk about this quite a long time because I think it's actually quite fascinating. There's been a very large movement here among a, a, the young male population, uh, which is uh, self-described as anti-feminist. Um, and I would just say, frankly speaking, they're openly and, and, and sickeningly misogynist. Um, and you know, your, your question is, why are the left-leaning parties not putting more pressure on someone like uh, E.J. Myung to, to do better on this? Short answer is, I, I think, in the first place, the left is splintered. So there is one you know, candidate from the Justice Party, Shim Sang Jung, uh, you know, who's, who has a pretty good record on this, and she brings it up in the debates. Um, she brings it up in, in public discussion, but she just doesn't have enough purchase in the electorate um, to make much of a difference. The left is in some cases otherwise splintered and frankly speaking, half crazy. Um, so that's part of it. But more importantly, I think this, is, this issue is unfortunately or fortunately, depending how you look at it, not really salient on voters. You know, ultimately voters right here I, at the moment, I think really care about two things. Um, one of which is uh, housing policy. Uh, in a recent poll, I think it was like 27% of the population said that this was, in the, it was the plurality for what's the most important issue. Uh, so housing policy uh, is most important. Uh, and second is you know, jobs and employment related um, policy. Those are the things that people care about. And this makes sense when you look at the fact that you know, there's a, a, a youth in particular, you know, less than 30 um, sort of jobs crisis where coming out of university, it's very hard for people to get good white collar jobs that have this sort of social standing as well as the economic prospects going forward um, that, that people want and that in some sense, Korea tells itself that it has now created universally because it's become such an important, um, you know, post-industrial uh, economy with such a high you know, GDP and per capita GDP. And then secondly, when you look at the fact that all over Korea, housing prices are exploding, at least in the urban areas where Seoul, just within the last five years, uh, housing prices have more than doubled. Uh, so it makes getting into the housing ladder um, really hard. Uh, so that's really what people care about in these gender issues and frankly speaking, strategically looking forward, demographic issues. I mean, there's a massive uh, demographic cliff coming up and everyone laments the fact that there aren't enough babies being had in this country. And yet you look at the massive misogyny, you look at the, in the incapacity to build a work-life balance here. Uh, and you wonder, well, gee, why could that be the case that they're not having children? And the answer is because people, especially women, are opting out of having children quite rationally. And no one seems to have an answer for this. Um, and unfortunately, the left parties you know, just can't break through this. At least the ones that are concerned about this issue aren't able to break through the wall of, um, of housing and employment as being the most like, immediate salient issues. Um, I'll leave the North Korea question perhaps um, to, to Scott and, and Ji Young simply for... Um, for, for time. Um, I will say the you know, interesting thing about Park Geun-hye, indeed she was pardoned. Um, you know, I think you know, this probably was a mixture of, uh, there were probably a mixture of factors here. Um, you know, Moon probably wanted to help his party a little bit and thought this might do something a little bit for the Democratic Party candidate. Uh, I think this was also you know, a, a legacy issue. Uh, my guess is he might be looking at himself <laughs> going forward. Uh, because uh, Yoon suk yeol has already said in a sort of bizarre way of phrasing it, at least in English, that he's going to quote unquote probe Moon when it's over. Moon might not be looking forward to that. 
so I think he might be in some way paving the path, um, you know, perhaps for his own pardon. Uh, if this were to happen, South Korea has a history, of course, as we know, of, um, of prosecuting its former presidents uh, for all sorts of uh, forms of corruption. Uh, so, you know, I think that there's probably a set of reasons for that. Ultimately, again, I don't think that this is going to make much of a difference for voters. Um, as I said, I think housing and employment is really where the action is at. It's not foreign policy, uh, certainly, and it's not these more, uh, for lack of a term, extraneous issues, um, even though they might be quite important, um, that are moving voters. Any any question for Scott or Ji Young? Um, not, not, so much a, yeah. not, not so much. Not so much a, a question. I think they both actually covered everything really well. I would just say the, 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 the one thing I would sort of agree with Scott was say, you know, the one area where I think there is this more, as Scott put it, Bernie Sanders approach to things is in housing policy. Um, you know, here we do see a difference in the way that the two candidates are approaching it. But as you say, it's a platform, not actually, I think, what's going to happen when you come to governing. Uh, you know, Lee's basically promised to build two and a half million housing starts, um, you know, primarily on the back of government spending, uh, whereas Yoon wants to, to incentivize the construction of a similar number of apartments or a similar number of housing units, but he wants to do it on the back of private investment that happens through tax reform to the comprehensive um, real estate holding tax. Lee, you know, Lee had, I think, much more of a Bernie Sanders vibe last year especially with what he wanted to do with a comprehensive landholding tax, which was basically to say that people would have to pay, uh, landholders or property owners would have to pay taxes on the value of their uh, uh, property assets, uh, not on the, the value of a transaction when it actually occurred. Effectively speaking, it's a form of you know, landholding wealth tax. He's backed away from that. Uh, and part of the reason why he's backed away from that is because uh, he wanted to use that to finance a universal basic income or a near universal basic income. And he's backed away from that as well. So I think, you know, although he has, you know, some some of these kind of Bernie Sanders streaks built into what he wants to do. And if he had his druthers, he might carry it out. Uh, I think there's some some pretty significant constraints, not the least of which is the fact that the population doesn't really believe that he's the candidate to carry that forward, partially because he's, you know, he's carrying the mantle of Moon's failure over the last five years. And so when you look at the polling results, 40% of the people, so the plurality, think that Yoon is the better candidate on housing policy, less than 30% think it's Lee. Um, so I think he's going to face some political constraints, uh, even though his platform might be a little bit more Bernie Sanders on housing uh, than that of Yoon. Right. Thank you. Scott? Yeah, well, I think Mason hit just the right point there at the end uh, as related to the albatross around Lee's neck uh, of being associated with the ruling party, because if this election is going to be a referendum on ruling party performance, uh, then, you know, voters are saying that they want a change. Uh, it's about a 47% plurality. Uh, and I think that probably explains why, even though both candidates are not very popular with the electorate, we see Yoon running slight, um, uh, very slight uh, margins uh, over Lee. Um, you know, with regards to the other candidates, um, you know, I, my way, so, so I do think that Shim and Ahn have had some impact on the debate, mainly as uh, second and third moderators in a way, because they've had chances mm -hmm. to question uh, both candidates. Uh, and Shim did uh, weigh in with Lee pretty strongly on Me Too. Um, you know, but, you know, as Mason said, I, you know, that particular labor base is running at two to three uh, percent in the polls. You know, in a way, if I think back about American politics, my analogy for Shim is more like Ralph Nader. Uh, and so in that sense, it's interesting that she's not getting more pressure to get out. Uh, but in a way, she has she does have a standing and a base uh, as representative of a party that has maintained a consistent small presence uh, within the National Assembly. Whereas on, I think, is basically, um, you know, the 
candidate who is trying to reap the benefit of being um, um, uh, not the main candidate. So, you know, his uh, popularity goes up basically as a protest vote. Um, I want to say a couple of words additionally on the gender gap issue, um, especially as related to the 20s, simply because there was a Chungang Ilbo poll in January that I think illustrates the situation very clearly in terms of the impact of misogynist positions on gender. And it shows that males in their 20s are going with the opposition party, something like 41 to 16. But females in their 20s, what's really interesting is uh, that their support rates for the ruling, par uh, ruling party run around 30%, opposition party 12, uh, but undecided or likely to uh, not to vote. There's a lot of alienation, 42% of women in their 20s are unlikely to vote. And so I think the net impact of all this is to drive women away from politics. Uh, and it's ironic because um, uh, the gender gap is so big that they could be uh, a swing vote. Uh, North Korean influence on the election. Uh, my view at this point is that the North Koreans are kind of on their own calendar and so inwardly focused that they're just going to do what they need to do in order to, you know, focus on their own objectives. If they had wanted to influence the election decisively, then they really should have bit on the end of war. Uh, and so I think that what we see is, you know, that the North Koreans and, you know, the vituperation toward Moon has been so strong. Um, I really think that they are carving their own uh, path. Um, I'll just say, Pak Geun Hye, I think that her release from jail was house cleaning to kind of get Park out of the way and to reduce the possibility that there would be disaffected conservative voters uh, mobilized to come out and vote precisely because Park was still in jail. Uh, so it was essentially an effort to remove that uh, as a potential issue. And then uh, Ukraine, I, I wrote a small piece on it. Um, I think that for South Korea, they've mainly so far focused on impact on energy interest and agricultural procurement. They're concerned about global prices. Uh, they are, I think, very aware of the uh, norm breaking behavior of the Russians. Um, but generally speaking, the, the, the modus operandi of Koreans in this case has been to try to keep their head down and try to insulate their commercial relationships. Uh, I think they're under more pressure not to do that now because they're simply more important uh, in the global picture. Uh, but this is also still relatively far away from them. So the really interesting question is, you know, as US sanctions ramp up, how um, quickly will South Koreans move to stay in step? Okay, good, and any, any comments or questions to the other two presenters? Um, yeah, I'm gonna ask ji to say a little bit more about whether or not there is a scenario where Japan, Japanese leadership can be receptive uh, to Korean efforts to improve the relationship, in particular in the context of a, a Yoon victory, simply because the Yoon platform, I mean, it's, I, I thought it was very forward leaning in referencing uh, Kim and Obuchi, DJ and Obuchi. Thank you, uh, Ji Young. And while Ji Young is speaking, uh, Scott and Mason, take a look in the uh, Q and A room. There's a couple of questions about Thad, which I may come back to you uh, both to uh, respond to. But Ji Young, please. Thank you. I'll try and address Scott's question first, and then I'll probably be able to address just a little bit about the Ukraine situation. Um, in the event that Yoon Song yeol becomes the next president of South Korea, I do think that there is a good chance for Japanese leaders to start thinking about ways to improve relations with South Korea. They are next to one another. 
um, they cannot maintain the current, you know, bad relations for ever. Um, so when there is a leader who's willing to take Japan seriously, if Yoon Song Yeol follows through what he has promised during the campaign, um, you know, Japan's political landscape about South Korea, I do see that it has changed um, significantly even compared to the time when Abe was the prime minister. I see that in Japan's discussions about its regional strategies and security, about its future, um, South Korea oftentimes is missing, which is um, actually new. Um, but they are interested in working together with South Korea, if not about China, but about North Korea and potential help that South Korea might be able to provide in terms of um, Japan's goals towards North Korea, um, including um, the abduction issue. I do not know if act leaders are actively talking about abduction issue as a potential area of cooperation, but that's something that can actually turn Japanese public opinion around because that's a very emotional issue that is receiving a lot of attention from um, people. Um, so uh, to answer your question, I do think that there is a good chance, um, but um, I also see that um, political landscape amongst the policy elites have um, changed. Um, so. Um, I probably would say yes, if it was say a um, few years ago, uh, definitely, but this time um, optimistic, uh, hopeful, hopeful optimistic, if that makes sense. About Ukraine, um, again, um, I, I think, I do not see this issue becoming uh, a factor um, in election for voters, but in terms of kind of looking at the narratives that come out of the campaigns, um, you know, um, about this issue, Yun Song Yar, you know, clearly kind of saying that um, what's happening is against the international law, um, and um, basically the message is that's why we have to maintain and strengthen our defense against any aggression and attacks from outside powers. Whereas um, Lee Jae Myung's position is limiting this to a regional affairs uh, without clearly pointing uh, the responsibility uh, finger at uh, Putin. So, um, and the narrative that comes out of this, as far as I can tell from media outlets um, is the importance of peace, maintaining peace. And um, maybe great powers are using the Ukraine situation to cover up their internal problems. Those are the things that, you know, I get to read uh, from the camps, you know, EJML camps. So again, I'm, I'm actually ex extending this interpretation probably far too much, but I do feel and sense that Yun Song Yeol camp is much more leaning towards maintaining and supporting the US-led international order, whereas Lee Jae Myung camp is much more about emphasizing autonomy and uh, you know creating as much space as possible for South Korean uh, diplomacy um, and really view the uh, Sino-US uh, strategic competition in that regard. Great, we're, we're running toward the end of the session. I do, however, wanna to get to the two questions on THAAD. Uh, so I'm gonna to go to Mason and then Scott and ask you to respond to uh, the questions about THAAD and then also any closing comment that you might have uh, and then we'll go to Ji Young for any uh, final wrap-up uh, comment, giving her the last word. But Mason, uh, if you would, on uh, on on Thad and what's driving Yoon's position in particular on Thad. Sure. So maybe I can somehow dovetail a little bit with what um, Ji Young just said. I'll 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 come around to that. Sure. Um, no notably, with respect to to what she just said about the relationship of that the Yoon campaign has to uh, the US-China uh, rivalry. So I think it's important to remember Yoon is not a politician. He's a former prosecutor. Um, you know, he doesn't have um, deep roots in the party. Uh, he doesn't, so far as we know, have a, a deep, uh, a deep experiment, experiential background in foreign policy. So to some degree, I think his foreign policy and his, his defense and security policy 
uh, is coming out of uh, you know his his foreign security and defense policy team, um, and so uh, you know I'm not sure we know necessarily a whole lot about his own personal uh, feelings and convictions. I'm sure he's developing them, and I'm sure he has them, but you know we don't know exactly. I think where they you know where they fall, except that they're largely in consonance with that of I think the the traditional you know PPP way of looking at the world. So his team, for instance, Pak Jen, who's kind of running his foreign policy team, who's a National Assemblyman, uh, Kim Sung Han, who's sort of the deputy there, who's a professor at Korea University and a former vice minister uh, in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know, they represent a very orthodox way of looking at how important the alliance is. Uh, and I think that that's being imported into the way that Yoon's policy platform comes out on an issue like that, as well as a lot of other issues as well in terms of you know the relationship with the Quad, uh, the free and open Indo free and open uh, Indo Pacific order, uh, and so uh, I think that we really need to pay attention. I think to what's going on sort of below the surface of, of Yoon in terms of his campaign team, and I, I mean just you know I, I don't know either of. You know, I don't know Yoon at all, and and you know I know some of his advisors a little bit, but it's not like we're great friends. Uh, but to the extent that I know them, I think that they're really principled believers uh, in the alliance. They're principled believers in the the in this you know U.S. led or at least you know U.S. Uh, supported uh, uh, international you know rules based international order. Uh, and I think to some degree you know, that policy position is relatively genuine. I don't think that this is just, you know, fishing for voters. Um, I think this is actually what they really think. Uh, and so to that extent, um, you know, the question becomes, you know, how is that principled vision going to collide with reality uh, when you start actually talking about the costs and the trade-offs that are imposed uh, when you want to put a THAAD battery uh, on your territory, either for your own benefit or for that of, uh, of the U.S. Rock Alliance and the U.S. military. And the, 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 the sort of point that comes back to what, to what Ji Young said is, you know, I think the, this team uh, is really looking to try to, of course, get along with China, but clearly come down on the side of the alliance. Um, and you know, the, yeah, the question is going to be, you know, what are the costs going to be imposed on that? And will that platform be something that can be realized? Um, and how do you go about minimizing the trouble that that causes? And to some degree, I won't say this goes back to the three no's, which Ji Young also talked about, but clearly there was a sense in which the three no's uh, compromised South Korean sovereignty uh, on foreign affairs. Uh, and this is something that the PPP has you know, has been against from the very beginning. And so this sort of orthodox, um, you know, reassertion uh, of you know South Korean sovereignty through the alliance uh, is is entirely predictable. First of all, uh, and second of all, at least from a U.S. perspective, welcome. Scott, over to you. Yeah, I would say. Thoughts? Yeah, the statement. Well, the, I think the statement on that. Uh, it checks a lot of boxes politically uh, in terms of being able to highlight uh, the differences between conservatives uh, and progressives in terms of their basic postures. Uh, but I really want to underscore, you know, what Mason has said about Yoon being kind of, in terms of his personal views, being a black box and frankly an amateur on foreign policy uh, and to extend it to Lee. Uh, because we've got exactly the same situation on the uh, ruling party side. Uh, Mason also referenced uh, contending schools, I think, earlier as related to uh, candidate uh, Lee. Uh, and it's really complicated because I think in recent weeks, uh, we've heard more on foreign policy from foreign policy professionals um, uh, that are known, uh, like Wee Sung Nak. Uh, but there are other people who have been with Lee longer and who are closer to him in terms of ideological view who um, have not been as easy for the US to work with. I'm thinking former National Security Advisor Lee Jong Suk, for instance. And so, you know, in a way, the really, maybe the biggest drama the election is going to be determined by all the issues, uh, the silly issues that Mason laid out, you know, at the beginning. Uh, 
but in terms of posture, it has pretty significant uh, implications as uh, the starting point uh, from which South Korea navigates uh, the environment of constraint that Mason also pointed out. Ji Young, any final thoughts before we go back to Rob? Thank you. I, I um, tend to agree with uh, Scott and Mason. One additional thought to you know uh, Yoon Sung Yeol's foreign policy messaging um, from a campaign strategy point of view, this somehow does make sense because he's running on um, you know based on the um, the um, complaints, if you will, um, or the 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 disagreements that you know South some portions of South Korean society felt towards the ways in which Moon administration handled foreign policy. It's not considered as one of his stellar accomplishments, according to many experts and scholars and people in general. So um, you take a position, you know, that becomes the opposition of the Moon uh, foreign policy. Then you know some of the issues that comes up is, you know, you Mason, you mentioned the question of sovereignty, you know. Um, so the messaging here is South Korean national defense foreign policy is up to us and we will make a decision. It's not going to be up to somebody else's. So, I mean, it kind of speaks well to those who would really like to see those nationalist kind of sentiments. And also it really speaks very well to those conservative voters who probably, you know, who have actually expressed their frustration over the ways in which South Korean foreign policy has been uh, run in the last five years. Well, thank you to all three. And let me turn it back over to Rob for any closing comments, Rob. Thank you. I want to thank each of our three speakers for these great presentations and for the knowledge that you've shared today. To those who of you who have joined us from Eastern US time, thanks for devoting your evening to this program. And to our speaker who's in Seoul, thank you for devoting your early morning and your quarantine time to this. I also want to thank all of you who submitted questions and contributed to this enlightening discussion and to Ralph, you're as always an excellent moderator who contributes a great deal to the discussion itself. We have a post event survey for each of you, which we hope you will take time to fill out and hopefully contribute to making future events in this series more beneficial. That said, I'm confident that those of you who joined us today gained from the discussion. If you are not familiar with comparative connections or have not yet taken the time to read it, this is the level of analysis you can expect with each issue. We will publish our next issue on May 15th, and you can visit it by visiting our website at cc.pacforum.org. You may download the entire issue in PDF form at the top of the page, as well as download individual chapters or simply read them online. I hope that you will read Comparative Connections, cite it in your own work, and spread the word. If you would like to continue to support the journal, support more events like this, and help us grow, please contact our development team at development at pacforum.org. We have a range of sponsorship options that can help you help us. Thank you all once again, and we will see you in the near future. Stay well and stay safe. Mm -hmm.